Hello everyone and welcome back to our show. Today everybody on this Saturday, November 3rd, we are grieving at Coffee Headquarters because of the passing of the mentor of many, Father Robert Taft. And as many of you will know, Father Robert uh, was uh, my doctor Vater, as they say in German, or the director of my doctoral dissertation. I unexpectedly, as many people did, yes, as many people did, but I, relatively late in life, I was in my 30s when I was uh, sent or blessed by my archbishop to uh, pursue doctoral studies after I had written a master's thesis at Munich University. Anyway, the story is long, but um, Father Robert Taft uh, read my thesis. Uh, he knew many languages, and one could send him, send him materials in any really language known to the civilized world, one could say, and he would read it. And I, uh, anyway, I called him by phone and asked him if he would read my thesis, which was in German, and it was on the topic, an obscure topic of the beginning of Matins of Byzantine, uh, that is Byzantine Orthros. Anyway, Father Taft did kindly uh, read the thesis after a few months, and I sort of, uh, yeah, I did, uh, yeah, I was a pain in his neck about it, for him to read it, but he sent me, after a while, this really long email, just taking it apart, taking it to pieces, really. Um, he just really attentively read it in every footnote. And at the end of his email, I had never received such feedback, you know. It actually felt like a great honor. And uh, he says at the end of it, he says, but when you make these modifications uh, to your, uh, you know, to this thesis, then I will be glad to publish it, and I'd like to invite you to speak at this conference that I am organizing, uh, you know, in Eichstätt, Germany. Because I was in Munich, that was around the corner from me. There I met Father Taft, and there I also gave my first paper in a very uh, illustrious community of scholars. Taft introduced me to a lot of people. He offered to direct my doctoral thesis. I'm asking Juliet to not shuffle around the papers here. Um, so Father Robert Taft, teacher of many, father of fathers, has passed away. I was blessed to see him um, three weeks ago on my latest trip to Rome, um, and he was already everybody's skin and bones. He had really um, declined even since the last time I saw him, and I had seen him at the end of last year, and he had had a stroke, and it was already uh, quite, um, you know, frail. So, but he was at peace. He was very prayerful. One thing to be said, and I'll show you some pictures, everybody, uh, of this great giant. If you haven't heard of him before, or maybe he didn't touch your life, I think that anyone across the board of the Christian traditions um, might simply say a prayer for this great uh, man who served uh, in very honest scholarship, uh, regardless of one's denomination. Uh, he, he really was interested in fostering the best in anyone who uh, somehow expressed uh, some kind of capability or, uh, you know, how do you say, um, capability or interest in pursuing uh, academic scholarship in the area of liturgy. And the breadth of his, uh, of his insights and the way he could connect the dots and really play like a maestro the many sources that he had at his fingertips, hundreds of manuscripts that he had meticulously researched, that he would go back to these sources and try to make sense of what they're saying. Because it's one thing to get your hands on ancient manuscripts, but he, as he said, he said it's one thing, you know, to know a lot of intricate details of facts, he said, but to connect the dots between these uh, pieces of evidence throughout history, 
For example, say we see a moment in the liturgy. We see it appear for the first time, something like a certain part of the prothesis or something. He'll say it's in this 13th century manuscript for the first time, say from Sinai or something like that. Um, but why does it appear there? Uh, is it indeed the first time and so forth? He says, to establish that, you have to have something between the ears. <laughs> he says, anybody could just list a lot of bits of evidence. So that's an obvious fact. But Taft was very direct. He, as it says in his obituary, uh, now being circulated and so beautifully written by one of his close friends, another Jesuit, Father um, uh, John Baldwin. Many people will know the name of Baldwin, also a well-known uh, Roman Catholic scholar of liturgy. Um, anyway, as Baldwin writes uh, in his obituary about Father Taft, just wait a second, everybody, because I have a lot of fun pictures that I'm going to share with you, photos of Father Taft's life that I would like to just take a moment to share uh, with you uh, this, this great um, heart and mind and soul that really taught me um, to taught me uh, a bit of uh, I would say refreshing honesty uh, and the courage uh, to be myself as he was and uh, he actually was um, often maligned uh, for his directness he was often described as being arrogant. He was introduced once uh, at, a, at a conference, but really, you know, he was sort of, uh, his irreverence sometimes uh, with respect to, uh, you know, a certain situation uh, actually was an expression of his humility because he was not concerned really with what other people would think of him. He wasn't uh, trying actually uh, to gain other people's respect, he simply had it because of the giant that he was. Uh, anyway, uh, Baldwin writes about Taft. He says, uh, Baldwin says, in fact, Taft was really a generous, kind, and gentle soul. Oh, wait a minute, everybody. See, I'm, I'm a little all over the place. Please forgive me. I was about to tell you the joke that what Taft, how Taft opened one of his speeches. So he's introduced to give a, a, you know, an academic talk, and he's introduced as one of the greatest Byzantine liturgy scholars of our time. So he gets up to the mic and he says, who are the others? You know, so that was Taft. And so he was often understood as being arrogant, uh, but not by his students who loved him dearly because uh, it was mutual. Taft really uh, just went to great lengths to take care of his students and to teach them not only the technical sides you know, of academic scholarship, but about how to live a disciplined life, about how to be a loyal uh, member of one's church, even amidst uh, the path of having a critical scholarly mind and engaging in historical critical research. Because, you know, the kind of witness that is born by academic scholars is uh, one that does involve, as in Taft's case, martyrdom, that's tautological because I'm saying witness involves martyrdom, but it is a martyrdom because scholars, as Taft was maligned, for example, for his opinion based on his research and depth of knowledge and breadth of knowledge, when he made, he wrote a decision uh, for the congregation um, of, uh, you know, the Vatican congregation what is it called, of Eastern churches or four Eastern churches? One second. Yes, a Vatican congregation for the Eastern churches, uh, a consultor of which he was. He wrote a famous opinion about the anaphora of Adai and Mari, a certain anaphora in the Christian East, that does not have uh, expressly, anyway, the words of institution. Taft wrote that it could be accepted 
despite the fact that, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, to which he belonged, um, would not usually have uh, accepted an anaphora as, uh, you know, legit without having the words of institution. So Taft said it could be accepted and made his argument, and Rome accepted uh, Taft's opinion as the Roman opinion, like, you know, Roma, Roma locuta, uh, when Taft said it. So, uh, but Taft uh, did not always make a lot of friends for some of his opinions, and uh, that was his martyrdom, because he spoke his conscience according to that which he discovered in his research. Not without the framework, everybody, of faith, obedience, um, and an open heart to something called church, okay? He was not outside of that, nor above it in any way. He did his job in great humility. So, Baldwin also joked with Taft, wait a minute, I'll get to the pictures, all right, everybody? Um, Baldwin would say, Taft was known not only as a scholar and a master teacher, but also as a great wit and raconteur. Can you guys hear me well? Um, nobody's complaining. I see your comments, my beloved friends. Hello, everybody. I'll get to your comments. One second. All right. Um, I see Bombay, India with us. Everybody's praying for Taft. Thank you, my friends. Um, Okay, Andis is saying she has a time delay. All right, I don't know why. Good evening from India, says Cecilia. Good, good evening. All right, everybody, let, 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 me, um, let me read you this little passage, just a little bit, one more little passage from John Baldwin's, Father John Baldwin's obituary uh, in honor of Taft. So, Taft's language was often salty, writes Baldwin, who was often salty, and he could be acerbic with those he considered to be lacking in intelligence, learning, or good judgment. He was pleased when I often reminded him that underneath his gruff exterior lay a heart of stone. <laughs> so that's Jesuit wit for you, um, lay a heart of stone. But no, Baldwin, Baldwin writes further that, of course, something that Taft seemed to want to hide from the larger public was that he really was a kind and gentle and very humble soul. All right. So anyway, studying with Father Taft, and I was his assistant when I was living in Rome, altogether really for two years um, uh, was that experience. Anyway, um, Taft would teach us things like, uh, you know, about the importance of consistency, of coming to the library when the library I'll show you some pictures now from uh, so here we go you see this picture of uh, yours truly with Father Taft explaining something to me from a lexicon uh, we're trying to get to the bottom of something uh, that we are researching and uh, he's showing me something in the library so this this was everybody probably around um, 2007, I would say. So that's one of my library pictures with Taft. Here was where I would always sit. That was Taft's, this is the Pio, I said Pio Library, everybody. That is the Pontificio Istituto Orientale. It's the Oriental Pontifical Institute in Rome, where it's right on the Piazza Santa Maria Maggiore, the, you know, across from the famous church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. Anyway, at this institute, I studied uh, under Taft's direction and also became his graduate assistant. That's his chair. Those of you who have been to that library and maybe were there those years would know that Taft's solemn march into the library in the morning um, was this thing you could rely on. Um, his schedule was, my friends, like this very disciplined, you know, Jesuit of that generation, um, rock solid. He would be up at three in the morning. I am not exaggerating. He made no secret about it. 
He would go and shower. Then he would uh, get dressed. He would say his private prayer rule, which consisted of the first hour, read in Slavonic, Pirvichas, as it's called. That's what he would read. Then he would be off to the chapel of the Rusikum, where he would always be the first to arrive and to light the, the icon uh, lamps, which actually was a job of the seminarians, but he was there first, so he would get this done. He would be do some commemorations uh, at the prothesis of people who's, who had something special happen that day, those who died on the date. Taft kept a meticulous record. He had what he called his diptychs, this, this notebook, where every year he would fill with whatever whoever died on the day. It was this calendar that he had. And it kept getting, you know, filled in with names of the living and the dead. If somebody had something happen in their lives, like a wedding, he would have the date marked. And he would every year pray for these people. Let me just show you a few other library pictures. So that was this one. Here I am, you know, looking at something he's showing me. Father Taft would, um, he would, he would, you know, really put in the time to explain and to look over my work. Uh, I have to say, I would get, as I was writing my doctoral dissertation and I would get it typed out, a section I would get completed, I would give it to him uh, to look at. And I would get these pages back, probably the next day, right? All marked up with red. I have these papers uh, with Taft's handwriting all over them. All these red marks, you know? And it was really a great honor uh, to be criticized by Taft. But I have to mention something else, that as I continue to work with Taft, he would also on occasion give me something he had written and ask me to make comments. And here's an interesting part of this collaboration between an Orthodox nun and a Roman Catholic a Jesuit scholar, all right? Um, not only is it incredible that me, a beginner, was asked to make comments on Taft's work, but also that uh, he was sincerely interested, especially in some theological point I would make. And there's only one point, really, everybody, that I remember making that was critical and that he accepted and changed. And it was, I noticed it several times. I said to him, when you discuss the theology of liturgy, you're so Christocentric. You never mention Pentecost, and you don't seem to mention the Holy Spirit. I said, you're discussing Byzantine divine liturgy. How come I'm, um, you know, really not hearing that much about the Holy Spirit? I didn't say it like that. Uh, I wasn't that, you know, cheeky about it. Um, but, you know, I noticed that to him. And he's like, oh, yeah, you're right. So he's like, here, where? And he would change things. Uh, and if you know Taft's work, you will be, you know, amazed that a man of that caliber, fellow of the British Academy amongst his other honors, but he was particularly... Um, he was proud, you know, not even for himself, but he would say, I was the first uh, Jesuit priest. You know, he was glad to sort of, for his team to get that honor. So um, I wanted to share that, everybody. I will be going to his funeral, by the way, which is coming up on November 12th at Campion Center. Check out my Facebook page if you want the details on Taft's funeral coming up. Weston, in Weston, Massachusetts, at his retirement home called Campion Center, where, everybody, he died, okay? He died on All Souls Day, yesterday, November 2nd, in the Roman Catholic calendar, that is All Souls Day. So he was received as one of the souls amongst all the souls in the bosom of Abraham and in the bosom, everybody, of the God he served. Let's show you some other pictures. Um, right, or not. Look, let's look, everybody, at some of his childhood photos. This is Taft with his three siblings. 
He did have another sibling who was born later. Am I mistaken about that, or is Kathy there? So, this is Father Taft. Sorry, I am disoriented. The curly-haired little boy. Um, his older brother, Jim, is in the middle. And we see Eleanor, his uh, sister. And I think that must be Kathy, right? Am I mis I'm mistaken, though. I'm making a mistake. I'm forgetting his brother. I'm sorry, everybody. And I hope his brother doesn't see this. I think his brother's name, I've never met his brother, actually. I have met his sister, Eleanor. I never met Jim, who died before Father Taft did. Um, so I think that's his brother, David. Forgive me, Taft's family, if I made a mistake. I never met David, but I think Taft would always say that he's the nice Taft, because the Tafts are known as being very strong characters. But anyway, that's Father Taft as a child. Now, let's look at, one second, the next picture. When Father Taft became a novice, see what a good-looking young man he was? He dedicated his life to God and to serving his church at the age of 17. Here we see him. I believe he is 17 in this picture. And he um, became uh, a Jesuit. Uh, well, here he's entered the novitiate. So Taft did indeed lead a celibate life, a chaste life, all fr from his very youth um, and was very much, you know, very much this, this soldier of God. So a very wholesome, a very wholesome uh, personality. Uh, while being so very human, you know, Taft could curse, you know, he um, he he could tell the the off color joke, you know. He'd say stuff like, "Well, this is not actually off color, but it's a little bit of a you know typical kind of Taft joke." He'd say, "I I dedicate my mornings to the Judeo Christian heritage." He says, "To the Judeo Christian heritage," and uh, if you ask him, "How's that?" He says, "I, I celebrate liturgy." That's the Christian heritage. And then I read the New York Times. <laughs> the Judeo heritage. You know, not, not an anti-Semite, but he thought it was funny to say things like that. All right. So, um, not that that's anti-Semitic, right? Juliet, Juliet's like, I don't know. I don't know. Taft said it. So that's Taft at 17, uh, dedicating his life to God. Um, and here he is. This is uh, Taft, where he was... Sorry, I'm going to have this issue of my head in the way, but I wanted the pictures to be big enough. Now I'm yelling because I'm afraid I'm too far from the computer um, for you to hear me. Um, but look at this. Taft is has entered the novitiate. He, he's a novice, Jesuit here. Maybe I'm not using the proper terminology. And here, this is the sibling that was born later, everybody, than the picture you just saw. This is Taft's mother, his mom, um, and Kathy was a sister that was born. She was the baby of the family. So Taft, see, there was a big difference in age uh, between Father Taft and his sister Kathy. Tragically, everybody, his sister, whom he loved like crazy, he would tell me that he'd come home uh, on the rare occasion when he was allowed to come home from the very strict uh, you know, Jesuit training that they had. Kathy would come running, you know, and, f and throw herself into his arms. So, um, tragically, everybody, Kathy died. Uh, she died I'd, um, rather early in life. Not as a child, but she was, I don't know, she must have been, I don't know exactly how old she was, but she was the first to die of the siblings. Perhaps she was in her 40s, but, you know, very much too um, early you know, to die. So Taft, oh, Taft, Father Taft also lost his father very early on. Um, he wasn't a child, but I think he was in his, maybe already in his 20s. I'm not sure, but his father died rather young, perhaps around maybe, I don't know if he reached the age of 50. I'm not sure of that, but his, his father died young. Um, and so his mom was left with um, these, uh, his I guess four siblings, right? 
um, sign, and Kathy died first. And now, uh, uh, not so long ago, but it's been a few years, Father, uh, Father Taft's eldest brother, Jim, who was the mayor, I believe, of um, uh, Scranton or some, anyway, somewhere in Rhode Island, very political family, uh, all diehard Republicans, except for Father Taft. <laughs> He's a Democrat in the family. Um, but his Taft, in fact, of course, yes, Taft is of those Tafts, of the 13th president of the United States was a Taft. So yes, Father Taft is related uh, to the president. Uh, a very, yes, a very strong uh, Irish American and uh, cultured family. I mean, this is, this is, I think, the closest we come to having an American aristocracy, you know, this very, uh, this very American uh, Republican also family in this case, except for Father Taft. Um, uh, anyway, fun fact also, Taft's niece, the daughter of his sister Eleanor, um, Martha McSally, is in these midterm elections running for the senator of Arizona as the Republican candidate there. So Martha McSally is Taft's niece, the daughter of his sister, Eleanor. Isn't that a fun fact? Yeah, so anyway, uh, it's a small world between uh, great talents of various sorts. Um, let's look at a few more, look at this sweet picture of, this is Father Taft as also a uh, novice in the Jesuit order hugging his sister, Kathy who was to die early in life. Anyway, everybody, every uh, life is uh, quite an amazing mystery. Here's a fun picture of Father Taft. I, th I don't know if he's here, what, late 20s? I'm not sure. Early 30s, maybe. Uh, just a few more, just a few more pictures, everybody. Father Taft's, um, you know, pictures. One second. I have done something wrong. Here he is uh, around the same time, I suppose, in a collar. Uh, rather young priest. Here, Father Taft received, see, he's holding up his well-known book on the Liturgy of the Hours in East and West. I've got a copy of it here. Amongst the 34 books that Father Taft wrote, he wrote this excellent uh, book, a uh, very good uh, introduction to the topic of the Liturgy of the Hours in East and West. And he's holding in this picture, where are the pictures in hard copy? Here they are. What he's holding up here, he wrote, when he sent me, he sent me a lot of these pictures because um, I had asked for them. Uh, and uh, he wrote on the back of this one, see, this is the hard copy of the picture. He writes on the back of the picture that it's 1986, holding the first edition of Liturgy of the Hours, plus the first prize for best book in theology, which it won that year. So he won a prize for best book in theology. I don't know what the prize is called. You can't tell on the photo, but, you know, he was, he was well known from the minute he entered the scene when he published his first, his, his doctoral dissertation as a book. Let's see this, one second. The Great, everybody knows the classic, The Great Entrance, right? And that was, I believe, in 1971. Taft was really around for a long time. You know, he was active on the academic scene, really dominating the, the area of uh, Byzantine liturgiology. You can't swing a dead cat in the area of topics, uh, topics involving somehow the Byzantine liturgy, that he did not somehow have a hand in uh, s beginning to study, uh, or really paving the way for those who would later uh, follow in his footsteps as to what should be studied. You know, he would sometimes say about, one second, I just wanted to show you the great entrance. See, this immediately, immediately um, just was acclaimed uh, it took by storm the whole scene of the study of liturgy, this, this book, on, on what is just a few minutes of Byzantine liturgy. 
the divine, uh, the great entrance. Uh, it when Taft started looking at it, it turned into this this volume. Okay, and um, it, it's you can read in obituaries dedicated to Father Taft. Now there are several uh, more about his life's path. But anyway, he was uh, he always said that it, there was nothing ingenious about him. That he was just a hard worker. There's no doubt about that. He definitely had a work ethic that uh, was incredibly uh, inspiring. Uh, but um, there was also, as he would say, something going on between the ears that helped him connect the dots. You know, to make uh, insights that were that other people didn't see, and also to to write in such readable as Father Baldwin writes in the obituary to him. Taft wrote such readable English that it's a delight to read uh, what he writes, and it's often funny, it's witty, you know. Um, we want to put this back. If you want to check out something that Taft wrote, it would be good to either start with this, The Liturgy of the Hours in East and West, look it up on Amazon, or you could look at, one second, um, Beyond East and West. Wait a second, is this it? I have no. That's not that's my book. Actually, oh here it is. All right. So there's this book. Uh, it is a, just a series of essays that are just central uh, and brilliant um, and uh, eye openers to how to go about uh, approaching Byzantine liturgy, on uh, researching it. There's important methodological observations, but even for someone who's not going to professionally, you know, pursue um, academic scholarship in this field, but definitely for those of you who are interested in studying um, on a, you know, on a serious level, on a level that actually will be helpful, and not just sharing your thoughts while shaving, um, Byzantine liturgy. Uh, this is a must-read. Okay, beyond. East and West, Problems in Liturgical Understanding. All right, look that one up if you're interested, everybody. But it's a nice read, even if you're not, you know, if you're not going to, for whatever odd reason, dedicate your lives to the study of Byzantine liturgiology. Why wouldn't everybody do that? Right, Juliet? So, let's look at some other pictures. Everybody, don't get uh, upset with me that I am not looking at your comments, all right? Because we want to just get through some more pictures, fun pictures of Father Robert Taft, who has died, in case you're only joining us now, on All Souls Day, right? What a blessing. So he dies on All Souls Day. He, know, he also knew the right time, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> to die with liturgical meaning. Well, of course, on a selfish note, although there have been a few of them already, in case you didn't notice. Um, of course, we've been mourning those who love Father Taft and knew him. Uh, we've been mourning his sort of passing for a while because uh, he, well, he was 86. That's not, it's not always an old age, depending on how the person's life has unfolded. But Taft, he went so strong until well beyond his 70s, because I studied under his direction when he was, um, right before he reached the age of 70, and then he was 71, 72, I was studying with him at that age, and he was very, uh, you know, a very uh, dedicated, hard-working scholar on a daily basis, you know, always being invited to conferences, and he would be taking me to those like his little protege and insisting everybody he would insist to someone who invited him to speak and I I had I hadn't published anything yet maybe I published an article or something but you know I was definitely um, you know even less like of a, a you know of a, of a player um, in the field of Byzantine liturgiology as far as international scholarship goes then but he would say to the organizers who invited him to speak Number one, he'll come if they fly him first class. I mean, he would say stuff like this, and he would get what he asked for because people wanted him to speak. Secondly, his assistant, 
moi, I had to also be invited and to be to give a paper. This is how he would promote his students, you know, to 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 give them a foot in the door and uh, to to push them forward. He was interested in promoting young scholars, uh, and it's not you know if you study at European universities. I think it's more common in American universities, this kind of, even though Taft was in Rome, but he was American, very much so. Um, you, you're not used to, here in Europe, to professors being so self-offering to their students. Um, there's a lot of self-importance, and I don't want to be judgmental of people, but it's a culture. It's a certain culture of the academic, uh, you know, uh, milieu here. and. Uh, Taft had none of that, you know. He, of course, he could be very honest if he thought, you know, that you're not, you know, you're, you're not uh, actually contributing anything of value. Um, but he would, uh, it, you know, if he uh, saw that uh, you were willing and uh, able to pursue. A valuable work in this area that he loved so much and that he lived because he every day his life was very much liturgical deeply liturgical I would say deeply prayerful in a Jesuit way also you know the Jesuits uh, because of the experience and also practices of Saint Ignatius of Loyola uh, or Loyola um, found a way to combine uh, serious work in some area, uh, also the academic area, with a life of prayer. And the two were not in conflict with one another. It wasn't either or. Now, I grew up in a culture, probably because of certain aspects of Palamite, Palamite, for the kids at home who don't know what that is, <laughs> Influenced by Gregory Palamas, wonderful saint of the Eastern Church. Uh, I have a video about that saint, by the way, on Coffee with Sister Vasa. Just a quick plug for that little show. Um, anyway, because of certain aspects of Palamite uh, monasticism, um, serious education for a monastic is not like either vital or even really um, welcomed. I have to say that because I uh, was, uh, you know, have been, uh, I can say, quite well read in, in ascetical literature. And I knew and was convinced also that, you know, it was a distraction to prayer to be too uh, involved in study. Somehow the practice, say, of incessant prayer seemed to be difficult to combine with. Uh, say, serious academic work. And uh, by meeting Father Taft and learning from him, not only, like I said, the technical side of academic scholarship, but also uh, the, the way one lives and combines uh, academic scholarship with prayer and being a member of the church, I, I learned to be able to combine those two, well, you know, to as I do, not not perfectly, but anyway, I valued that kind of also being able to benefit from uh, a culture uh, and spirituality uh, of uh, another church. So I thank God for that. Let's look at just a few more pictures and then we will finish this. Look at this fun picture, Father Taft with uh, smoking a pipe, which he did for many years. <laughs> And then he quit smoking altogether, but I forgot. He told me when he quit smoking. I didn't know him as a smoker. So there's Taft smoking a pipe. Here is Father Taft. Uh, he's a tourist somewhere. Uh, maybe I'm supposed to know what this building is, but I don't. Here is Father Taft giving a talk somewhere at a podium. Here is Father Taft in Disneyland. No, oh. No, that is Father Taft in Kiev. See, that little joke wasn't mine. The thing is that Juliet, who's not well uh, acquainted with the Christian East, 
She goes, where is this in Disneyland? <laughs> Sorry, everybody. We're not trying to be insulting anybody, but she, you really send that, right? She says that this is, was this him in Disneyland? So anyway, no, it is a beautiful church in Kiev. Um, here, Father Taft is here with his mother and someone in his family. I I can't see it well from here. But anyway, is running for office. There, It says Taft. Do you have, oh, here's the picture. I can't see. Do you see what it's, oh, it says re-elect Senator Taft. Vote Republican. So someone's running for senator there. Um, you can see Taft is considerably younger than any time I knew him. All right, everybody. I have to, I know, um, I have to wrap things up. Oh, here's a great picture. Uh, I know I'm blocking my face again, but that I am. that's okay. Here is Father Taft cooking uh, a dish for, for which he is famous. He would cook for many people, anyone who would agree to it. Pasta... Uh, carbonara. He like his carbonara was something he prided prided himself in. So here he is cooking somewhere uh, pasta a la carbonara, and he was it was delicious, I think, um, as far as I remember. Here, Father Taft is with uh, really great scholars. Uh, they are married, a man and wife who both studied uh, and learned from Father Taft, Stefano Parenti. We can just see part of his face. Stefano, I'm sorry if you're seeing this. And Elena Vilkovska, his wife. Well known uh, for many uh, scholarly works, but um, also for editing the famous Code Codex Barberini of the Vatican Library 336. Anyway, this is a couple. They are both professors, but when they met uh, and were studying, uh, that happened uh, under the tutelage of Father Taft, who then married them, these two famous scholars. They live in uh, Rome. Uh, I know them uh, because of because I lived there and uh, was introduced to these people, these wonderful people who are now grieving because our great teacher has passed. So what is another picture to show you? Another picture of Taft with his mom. She has passed as well. Here, another fun picture uh, Father Taft, very young, um, with another great scholar. Uh, she is a dear friend of Father Taft's, Professor Gabriela Winkler. See how pretty she is? Uh, uh, she is now, she is with us. Um, she is retired, lives in Germany, a great scholar uh, of also of, of liturgy, uh, also just incredible uh, knowledge of languages and Although she, she would say that she's more of a philologist. But anyway, Gabriela Winkler, a dear friend of Father Taft, and here they are pictured uh, young and studying uh, in Rome. And uh, I don't know what year this is. So, everybody, that's it for the fun pictures, okay? Let me see quickly. I'm sorry today I was not very attentive to your <laughs> comments. So let me say hello to you people. Uh, lovely uh, to see everybody. It's getting dark here. Maybe we should turn a light on. Um, I didn't realize, see, I didn't realize that this was going to happen. It significantly got darker. Now uh, I'm going to look a little creepy. Oh, good. I, I, I was like this dark figure surrounded by candles. It reminds me of this fraudulent website that went up using my pictures of me, calling me my Kutza Anna Maria or something like that, and saying that I asking for money for people to send money for me to heal them from from demonic possession in Romanian <laughs> it's a true story but if you see that we have nothing to do with it all right that was a fun story all right everybody I will be talking more I'm gonna be dedicating a podcast I shouldn't do that on the camera ever with Julia um, I'm gonna do a whole podcast about father Taft and about in more detail, I know I went into great detail now, but not that great detail um, about Father Taft. All right, his contribution to liturgical scholarship, but also some of my experiences with him. And if you sign up for our audio podcast, because we need you to everybody, please support us. Okay, plus you will enjoy subscribing to our audio podcast. You really will. These audio podcasts come out usually 
twice a week. I know I've been bad about it. I've been traveling, other things. I don't know. I've had excuses, Juliet. But they are, um, you know, things that I think you might be interested in. We had an audio podcast this week, finally. It was entitled, and it was about angels and demons. So is that an intriguing topic? Uh, We're going to have part two of that, about the invisible powers. Who are the angels? Who are the demons? And so forth. All right, let me take down Father Robert Taft S.J. Say a prayer for um, Archimandrite Robert Taft, okay, for the repose of his soul. All right, let's do that for him, everybody, and say thank you to God for his great witness. Anyway, subscribe here. Learn more, okay? There you can also get access to our liturgy course, ongoing divine liturgy course videos of that subscribe as a bonus subscriber my friends don't hesitate okay let me say hello to you lovely people though all right pete Vare, hello pete thank you and thank you i'm just going to say ahead i'm going to mention your names but thank you for your condolences thank you for your prayers for father taft like i said if you're joining us now i'll be going to his funeral that is going to be in weston massachusetts where he died at his Jesuit retirement home in Campion Center on November 12th at 10 a.m. All right, everybody, be there if you can. Um, I'm going with several members of my family, okay? My sister's going. Her husband is going to be playing Oh, Danny Boy. (laughs) Taft desired, one of his wishes was, well publicized actually, that at his funeral, not at the service, Afterwards, you know, at the reception, that somebody, because of his Irish descent, that somebody would sing the song, Oh, Danny boy. But anyway, when he heard me do that, he didn't want me to be the one to sing it. Ha, ha, ha. Um, He wanted it to be an Irish tenor. As it happens, though, anyway, my sister's husband knows how to accompany someone. He might perhaps sing it himself. He has a beautiful tenor. Um, Perhaps my nephew's going. Is this interesting to you people? I don't know. Let me say hello to you. Phil, hello, is saying hello. Phil Harwell, to you as well, Juliet. Hello, Phil. Um, Regula Veritatis, thank you, thank you. And Bob Krivanis, Karis Wadia, she's saying hello from Bombay, India. Hello from uh, to Bombay, India, Kayus Wadia. Oh, it's probably a man, though, right? Michelle Kochov, it's good to see you as always, Michelle. Beatles eternally, indeed. Uh, hello, Beatles eternally. Diana Hapala, good to see you, Diana. Thank you. May Father Robert's memory be eternal, indeed. Thank you. Caius uh, Wadia. Andis, we have already addressed your issue, right? But I'm sorry, this, this is Ami talking to us. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ami. I don't know why you get that delay. Julie Lucky, hello. Pete Vare, you're saying God used Father Taft's scholarship on Patriarch Maximus IV and the Second Vatican Council to draw me out of a very harsh pre-Vatican II Latin traditionalism and into Byzantine Christianity. Oh, did he? All right, Pete Vare, thanks for that. By the way, I heard from a friend who wrote me today, uh, Father John Chrysavgis, you know that he is a... uh, well-known theologian of the Greek Orthodox Church. He said, because you know he works closely also with Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople, he told Patriarch Bartholomew, this is what Father John Chrysavgis, my dear friend, writes me, he says he told Patriarch Bartholomew uh, about Father Taft's passing, and the Patriarch stood up and made the sign of the cross. You know, because he, they knew each other, Um, Father Taft knew a lot of people, of course, but uh, at one point they were studying in Rome together when both of them were young. Uh, The Patriarch before he was Patriarch, Taft before he was the Great Taft, as we know and love him today. Sally Pitt, hello to you. Marcy, Sally is writing to us from Glen Falls, uh, Glens Falls, New York. Well, hello to Glens Falls, New York, from my homeland. Marcy Shore, are you with us, Marcy? Good to see you, my friend. Um, My love and prayers for you and this amazing Father Taft. 
Thank you, Marcy. Beatles Eternally, let's please not forget to hit that like button. Oh, thanks, Beatles Eternally. I never ask you guys to like this. I only ask you to dislike. You know why? Because you know you're reaching outsiders. Like, you're really going beyond your, uh, you know, your, how do you say, your base, <laughs> uh, that you're, you're expanding when you get dislikes. All right? That's why I say do not hesitate to dislike. It's a sign that we are reaching outside of our little box here. All right. So, but remember, don't just dislike to please me. All right? I always like to say that. I haven't said it in a while. Don't just dislike to please us. Right, Juliet? Do it yeah. because you mean it. All right. Um, Pete Vare, thanks for the reminder. All right. He's thanking Beatles eternally. Cecilia, what are you telling us? Since he died on All Souls Day, he is lucky. Since on that day, we remember all the departed. Okay, yes. Uh, Beatles eternally, you bet, Pete. And welcome home to Byzantine Christianity. Dimitra Papadopoulos. Good morning, Sister Vasa. It's 1.35 a.m. here in Australia, so I should probably sleep soon if I want to get up for church. Sorry to hear about Father Taft passing. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Dimitra. Everybody, let me just tell you one last thing, because I really have to go. Um, let me just say quickly, sorry, everybody, if I didn't get to your comments. Um, you know, you know this always happens. Paul Zolonsky, hello, from New Haven, Connecticut. Hi, Paul. Pete Vare, I can't get to the rest of your comments. Love you, people. David Bollock. Paul, Yvonne Smolders, love you people. Sorry, I can't get to the comments. Hannah Svensson, I will look at your comments after we finish, however. All right, everybody? And then we'll talk about it next week, if I can. Elay Sonimas, hello. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your wishes, for your condolences. Bible Illustrated, hello from Serbia. Hello, uh, my friend from Serbia, Tommaso Cianti. Hello from Orthodox Italy. Hello, Tommaso, our old friend. Now, who else? Ron McBride from South Dakota. Hello, Ron McBride. ZJ Dimek. Hello, there you are, ZJ. I love Father Taft. Uh, I love his lectures via YouTube. Indeed, everybody, check it out. Look up his books. Look up his videos. Um, Pete Vare, what are you saying to us? Susan Yoder, Rosemary uh, Pifferetti. Everybody, I love you. Sign up, please. We need your support. Go to our website as well. Sign up for the daily reflections if you want a little dose of scripture in your coffee. With your coffee. It's, that, it's not like a new uh, slogan that's going to work for us. I love you, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Uh, and um, this was the topic we had to talk about today. Please pray for Father Robert Taft for the repose of his soul. And let's thank God for his witness. All right, everybody. Maybe I'll see some of you at his funeral on November 12th. Goodbye.